Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings to the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to poem number four of the 11 poems of Seadrift. This is called To the Man of War Bird. Now, this is one of the more unusual poems in all of Leaves of Grass. A lot has been said about the fact that this is, some have even called it a stolen poem of Walt Whitman's. Um, to, to the degree that it is, it, it's a paraphrase of, of a French poem, and so we'll, we'll be talking about that one in a moment. I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up um, in regards to the, the uniqueness of this poem. Now, our assumptions here that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, you have found our playlist, Talks with Walt, and you've been with us from the very beginning with our inscriptions all the way up to and including our introduction to the Sea Drift Collection, as well as the last poem that we worked with, Tears. Now, again, I mentioned that the background of this poem is intriguing, so let's go to our Nortons in here. Uh, this poem first appeared in the, Lo in the London Athenaeum, um, April 1st, 1876. It was an intercalation in some copies of Leaves of Grass, 1876, and again appeared in the Philadelphia Progress of November 16, 1878, with a headnote passage from Jules Mache's The Bird, English translation, 1869, and was finally placed among the Seadrift group in 1881. The poem is practically a paraphrase of the English translation of the French original, although Walt Whitman acknowledges indebtedness only in the Progress publication. Um, um, Adele and Knapp was the first to uh, note the parallel in The Critic. Um, Whitman had read Michel in English as early as April 1847 and was much influenced by his work, particularly uh, The People, English translation, 1845. Uh, and, uh, the, the whole relationship is reviewed by the great scholar uh, Gay W. Allen in Walt Whitman and uh, Jules uh, Mache. The uh, poem itself is going to celebrate uh, the frigate bird, that is to say the war, uh, man of war bird. These amazing birds, if, you, if you're unfamiliar, you should Google this and Google image this just to see kind of uh, uh, what we're talking about. So now let's turn to the poem itself. Uh, and enjoy some uh, rare use of the word thou. We don't see it a lot in Leaves of Grass, but here it is. Uh, and, and we'll enjoy this poem. Thou who hast slept all night upon the storm, that is to say, um, you know, been flying with the storm. Again, of course, storm already we've seen in Sea Drift several times. Waking renewed on thy prodigious pinions. Of course, renewed takes us immediately to the idea of of resurrection and obviously the phoenix bird. The fact that we're going to be talking again about flight and birds and we go back to Song of Myself passage uh, 52 and the barbaric yop of a hawk. Burst, notice the, uh, the uh, parenthetics, burst the wild storm, above it thou ascendest and rested on the sky thy slave that cradled thee. The fact that he uses the word slave and then later he's going to use in this poem the word Senegal is going to make this an interesting reference for us. Now a blue point, far, far in heaven floating as to the light emerging here on deck, I watch thee. So the speaker of the poem is on the deck of a ship. Myself a speck, a point on the world's floating vast. So this idea of being a speck, in other words, notice the perspective, and we've talked so much about this in our study of Leaves of Grass, how Whitman loves this idea of perspective and position, which is why, of course, in the Cedra of Palms, prepositions matter so much. That repetition of two words stacked together, we've seen this in Cedra several times. Far, far at sea, after the night's fierce drifts have strewn the shore with wrecks, and we've seen this whole idea of the shores and, and, and there being wreckage on the shores, with reappearing day as now so happy and serene, the rosy and elastic dawn, obviously we're thinking, of course, of our Homer there, the flashing sun, the limpid spread of uh, air cerulean. Now this idea of, of colors in blue, by the way, this is our, our one use of the use of the word in uh, Leaves of Grass. Thou also reappearest. By the way, the use of the word limpet takes us back to I Sing the Body Electric 5, you'll remember this, Limpet Jets of Hot Love, 
and there it was more sexual, right? Now, uh, this cerulean uh, idea is the bluest of blue in the sky, right? This idea of reappearing, coming back, the bird obviously being a symbol, a symbol of what? Freedom, hope, liberty. Thou, back to now the third use of thou, thou born to match the gale, thou art all wings. In other words, the bird symbol, uh, symbol of liberty and freedom can stand up to the storm, to the gale, and obviously we think about Emily Dickinson's classic, Hope is, a, is the Thing with Feathers. To cope with heaven and earth and sea and hurricane. In other words, the bird can stand up to any of those catastrophes. Thou ship of air, we're going to get to this notion of ship in the next poem, ship of state, and obviously it comes to its fruition when we meet, O oh, captain, my captain. Thou ship of air that never furlest thy sails, always sailing, days, even weeks, untired and onward through spaces, realms, gyrating. Go back, um, um, we'll come back to this when we meet uh, Dalliance of the Eagles with this word gyrating. At dusk thou lookest on Senegal at morn America. Of course, Senegal, that territory at the time when Whitman wrote the poem, territory in uh, French West Africa. The fact that he uses the word slave earlier and then here a mention of Senegal obviously gives us pause, as we've commented earlier about some of Whitman's references to uh, the issue of slavery in America. That sportest amid the lightning flash and thundercloud, we immediately think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind here. In them, in thy experiences, Hast thou my soul? What joys, what joys were thine? And Norton's will point out that this will remind us of Shelley's To a Skylark, a poem, by the way, both West Wind as well as Skylark. We've got full uh, uh, lectures on it, LearnStrong.net. There's a certain kind of reversal. You'll remember that in Skylark, the observation that Shelley makes is that the bird is never acquainted with pain and suffering as humans must be. And as we have said, the only difference between you and a bird singing in a tree is that the bird doesn't know about BBs, and obviously we do. That is to say, we know about death and, sor and sorrow and parting. Notice here, he'll say, the bird is only consumed with this idea of the joys, the joys that, uh, that are inevitable. Well, um, to, to uh, now finish at 2A, well, this is obviously a celebration of the bird, his freedom, his liberty, his strength, able at, to get through anything, even the terrible storms. Um, at 2B, we will point out again that this is a paraphrase of another poem, and to that degree, some have accused Whitman of plagiarizing the poem, and he didn't really want to talk very much about the fact that this poem of his was actually not a poem of his. At 3A, we've mentioned Skelly, uh, Shelley Skylark. Obviously, we can talk about Keats's Nightingale and Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. We've given uh, full lectures on all of that. We've mentioned as well um, Emily Dickinson's uh, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, and we've given a, a lecture on that as well. Finally, at 3B, we can ask about your own views regarding freedom and the notion of how freedom will survive all obstacles, as well as this simple question, what bird most inspires you and why? If earlier we were talking in Cradle about Alabama and Roll Tide, then we have to give our due, dil our due diligence here with the uh, War Eagle so that we get uh, both sides of the state uh, supported, if we will. Well, I hope that this is a poem that you can come back to and take a look at again and, and uh, be in intrigued by. Thank you.